Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome everyone, and thank you all for coming. I am Wing King Wong, founder and leader of the newly created Chinese alumni of MIT. Thank you for joining us to explore our American history and to celebrate Chinese American contributions to and achievements in our country, as reflected in three generations of Chinese American pioneers from railroad worker to World War II flying tiger to US Army general. Chinese American men and women persevered and overcame great odds to help build and serve our country despite discrimination and adversity. They are true great sacrifice and commitment to a better future for their children and community have enriched all of our lives. Today, we stand on their shoulders as their living legacy, a testament to their vision of a better life and a better future. They show us that as a nation, together, we can do better. In this event, retired Army Major General William Chen, the first Chinese American to wear two star rank in the US Army will take us through the three generations of his family. Among his many achievements, General Chen commanded the US Army Missile Command and later directed all of the Army's missile defense programs. After his presentation, General Chen will be interviewed by Air Force Major Kevin Liu, MIT class of 2008. Major Liu is in an Air Force program specializing in developing future leaders to counter emerging national security challenges. Welcome home, Major Liu, from your 10 years abroad. We will have time for Q&A after the interview. The chat function is not available, but we ask you to please send in your questions using the Q&A box at any time during this event. We will try to get to as many of them as time allows. And now, it is my honor to hand this event over to General Chen. Thank you. I'm gonna start with the first generation, my grandfather, and then the second generation, my father, probably spend more time talking about him for two reasons. One is he had a very colorful life. And second, in terms of a legacy of progress in going from the first generation to the second generation, it was a, a significant amount of progress, making it a lot easier for us in the third generation and beyond. So my grandfather, Chan Dot Fong, came from Hoi Ping, Guangdong province in Southern China. He came to the United States in 1878 with two of his brothers and worked on the Southern Pacific Railroad, which ran from California to Texas. Like other Chinese railroad workers, he endured hardship, danger, sacrifices, he had wages, probably 30 to 50% less than white railroad workers, but he survived the dynamiting at a time when the railroad company considered railroad workers expendable. He survived the lawlessness of the West when there was no law against killing Chinese. Interestingly enough, my grandfather was a letter writer, and so he helped his other workers to help in writing letters back home and then reading the letters when they got news from home. When the railroad was completed at El Paso, Texas, then the workers were released. So this is the completion of the second transcontinental railroad. And the significance there is the linkage from San Francisco to Los Angeles and Texas and beyond. And of course, the railroad workers scattered. Somehow, my grandfather wound up in Biloxi, Mississippi. 
he worked in a grocery store. Actually, he saved enough money and business was good enough where he went to New York City and a matchmaker was able to meet his bride 20 years uh, younger than him and they returned to Mississippi. But because of racial hostility and tensions, he lost everything in the business and had to move north and somehow decided to go to Ohio. And he, in Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio, where my father was born, uh, my grandfather set up a Chinese laundry. However, uh, my grandmother passed away when my father was 10 years old due to the Spanish flu. She did have a deathbed wish for my father, and that was that he would go to China to help China modernize. Actually, my grandfather did, didn't live much longer after my grandmother died. And in uh, 1924, my grandfather died when my father was 15. Let me now transition to my father. He was orphaned then and had to take care of a younger sister and brother. He had to work his way through high school and college. Uh, fortunately, uh, through a high school teacher, she encouraged him to go to college and he went to the University of Michigan. He studied aeronautical engineering and graduated with a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering in 1932. But he wasn't able to find a job in aero engineering because number one, it was the depression and number two, aircraft companies were not hiring Orientals even though he was American born. But that did not deter him because he had a passion for aviation. His idol was Charles Lindbergh. And so my father started working. He saved up enough money to take flying lessons. And he took those flying lessons at Roosevelt Field in Long Island the departure airfield that Lindbergh used for his solo flight. And then my father got his commercial uh, flying license. I'd like to now recap the major impacts on, my, on the life of my father, first name Moon Chen. The first major impact that he always talked about was his Michigan education. You know, not so much the academics, but learning from his contemporaries, learning from his classmates. As an American born Chinese, this was also the first time that he really met Chinese students from China. So they befriended him, he befriended them. In fact, he joined the FF fraternity, a Chinese fraternity for students in the United States, the first Chinese fraternity in the United States. And from that, he made lasting friendships. A second major impact on his life was becoming a pilot because that gave him a skill that few others had. It gave him confidence during those dark days of the depression. He even flew for the US mail service in an open cockpit biplane across the country. In 1935, he got his commercial pilot's license to include multi-engine uh, aircraft. And he went to China to Shanghai, but he didn't know anybody. And he didn't have any employment contract like many of us who have expat assignments these days. As a member of the FF fraternity, he stayed at the FF clubhouse in Shanghai because they had rooms there, meals there, very inexpensive. One of the first fraternity brothers he met there was a T.C. Shi, MIT Mining Engineering 1915. 
And so the natural question was, what brings you here? And then my father explained that he has a commercial pilot's license. He wants to fly for China National Aviation Corporation, CNAC, but he doesn't know anybody. So TC Xi then arranged for an interview for my father with CNAC. My father went to the interview, took a flight test uh, session, and then got hired. Now, this is an example of uh, the world we live in and connections. Some 40 years later, in 1976, my father's number two son, who's me, married Sandra. And it turns out that Sandra is the granddaughter of T.C. Shi, who he initially met when he went to Shanghai. So my father started flying. Most of the routes he flew were from Shanghai to Peking. And in fact, on July 7th, 1937, he flew over Peking and landed in Peking. Those of you that know the history know that on July 7th, 1937, was the Marco Polo Bridge incident where the Japanese attacked the Chinese army, and that was the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War. My father landed in Peking, and then he needed to get back to the airport, but the Japanese had roadblocks. Fortunately, my father knew the postmaster general in Peking. In fact, he was an FF fraternity brother, and so the postmaster then put my father in the back of a mail truck, filled it with mail bags, and then the mail truck took off to the airport. However, they were stopped by the Japanese. The Japanese soldiers would bayonet into the uh, mail bags, but fortunately my father was uh, hidden in the back. So the truck then got to the airport, he rounded up his crew and took off as the Japanese started firing at him. But luckily uh, the plane took off, he saved the aircraft. And of course, those of you know the history of uh, the Japanese massacre in uh, Nanking where upwards of 300,000 were massacred along with the looting and the raping of Nanking. And fortunately, my father uh, escaped that. In 1939, my father joined a company called the Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company, Campco. Campco was headed up by Willem Pauli of the Curtis Wright Corporation. He was the Curtis Wright Corporation representative in China. And when President Roosevelt in 1941 authorized the American Volunteer Group where American pilots would leave the armed services, volunteer for the American Volunteer Group and go to China, Camco was the company of record for all those American volunteer pilots and ground crew, including Claire Chenault, the leader of the American Volunteer Group. And of course, the American Volunteer Group became the Flying Tigers. Campco supported the American Volunteer Group during this period. And uh, my father was instrumental in helping the establishment, for example, of an aircraft manufacturing plant at Loy Wing uh, on the China-India border. The American Volunteer Group was operating only for six months in China, from December of 41 to July of 42, but uh, they gained air superiority over the Japanese aircraft at a time when they were outnumbered some 20 to one by the Japanese, and they were instrumental in saving China. My father had a chance to meet a lot of the AVG pilots, one of whom was uh, Tex Hill, a fighter race. And in May of 1942, at the Salwan Gorge, at the border of China and uh, Burma, separated by the Salween River, the Japanese were building a pontoon bridge 
to cross the river. But the Flying Tigers attacked the Japanese at the head of the column, the back of the column, the middle of the column, that prevented the Japanese from crossing the river. And of course, once they crossed the river, it was a relatively easy ride for them to get to uh, Kunming and capture Chongqing. And had that happened, China would have been lost. Now, the third major impact that on my father's life was working for General Claire Chennault. And so after Pearl Harbor, my father integrated into the U.S. Army Air Forces when he was at University of Michigan, the land-grant college. He took ROTC, so he entered as a first lieutenant and joined uh, Brigadier General Chenault, commanding the China Air Task Force. And later, when Chenault got promoted and took over the 14th Air Force, my father stayed on. He was a pilot. He flew C-47 and C-46 aircraft, and he flew the hump, which was the route, the primary means of resupply from India to China, flying over the hump, very hazardous, very dangerous, uh, limited navigation aids, weather forecasts weren't that good, and a lot of aircraft uh, were lost uh, flying that, but fortunately my father survived. Later on as a captain, General Chenault appointed him as his personal representative and liaison officer to the Chinese Air Force in Chongqing. Post-World War II, Chenault founded an airline called CAT, Civil Air Transport, and my father, along with a number of other uh, veterans of the 14th Air Force and Flying Tigers, stayed on working for the airline that General Chenault founded. My father took on different positions. He was an area manager, assistant to the president. He became a director of traffic and sales and a vice president for sales and marketing for the route that they had. Uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong, Taipei, Bangkok, and the Philippines. So it was a regional airline uh, in the Far East, American owned. Uh, when General Chenault passed away in 19... 58, a lot of the old timers that used to work for him left the airline, my father did so. He became a consultant for Northrop Aircraft Company along with a couple of Flying Tiger Aces. And later on, uh, he worked for Northrop uh, Aircraft Company as an aerospace company executive. In reflecting upon my father, my father strongly advocated that Chinese Americans assimilate, assimilate in the workplace, in the community that they're in. And he himself was very outgoing, affable, and confident. In fact, I wish I had those traits. He had a big booming voice. So if you were in a cocktail party, you know, everybody was centered around him. And of course, his advice was the need to mix and integrate with the company that you work for, the work environment that you're in, the community that you're in. Uh, he also was very proud being an alumnus of the University of Michigan. He gave back to the university. The university in turn recognized him with the Distinguished Alumni Service Award and also designated him as a distinguished aerospace engineering alumnus. In terms of the community, uh, some of you may know what free masonry is. He was a 32 degree mason and also a 33 degree mason, which is like a super grade. And so very few uh, Americans of Chinese origin have reached that grade. Now to transition a little bit to myself uh, as a third generation Chinese American. I went to the University of Michigan. I was in the ROTC program and graduated as a distinguished military graduate. I served 32 years on active duty and then served 18 years in defense industry. 
My career was in weapons systems acquisition. I had experience in the operational aspects of air defense systems, also the development, procurement, program management, and systems acquisition management of missile, air, and missile defense programs. I was the program manager of uh, two air defense uh, programs. And then, of course, I supervised the development and procurement of all the Army's uh, theater and national missile defense programs. In the uh, defense industry, one of my key assignments was uh, the U.S. general manager, vice president general manager of a joint venture U.S. Turkish company uh, where we produced combat vehicles. So with that, uh, let me close my remarks. Uh, I want to get to the questions and answers because I think uh, through the Q&A process, we can get into a lot more interesting dis discussion. But I'd like to close and go back to my father. Uh, he passed away at age 101. And his last gesture was a aviator's thumbs up. And I think all of you know what that means. You've seen all the movies where the pilots are in the cockpit. They give the thumbs up to the ground crew to tell everybody that everything is A-OK. -okay. Now, thumbs up in Chinese has a special meaning. And it means ding hao, which is the very best. And so with that gesture, what my father signified was he had a very satisfied life. Everything was A-OK -okay and ding hao. And he had confidence that the follow-on generations would have a legacy of progress that started with my grandfather as a Chinese railroad worker to my father and then to us in the follow-on generations. And with that, Kevin, maybe we can get into the Q&As. General Chen, sir, uh, thank you so much for sharing those stories with us. Uh, first question is just with, with such an inspiring history, how did you balance between embracing your heritage, uh, your cultural roots, and then American society? Okay, well, I think everybody needs to uh, come up with their own evaluation, assessment of themselves. Uh, in my case, I'm a third generation Chinese American, so I'm an American first. I appreciate my Chinese heritage, the Chinese culture, uh, the limited language that I uh, speak and understand, but uh, I think we really need to uh, believe in uh, who we are, where we come from, and in my case, as an American, uh, what is it that makes America great? Number one is the opportunity. Number two is the uh, um, rule of law and also uh, the fact that uh, we have the opportunities to uh, do what we want to do and uh, uh, lift up ourselves and improve ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, I think kind of a follow on uh, regarding your career. So a challenge that I've heard many people mention is that uh, finding a mentor that, that at work that they can relate to, especially with a similar background. So what would you approach as you progress throughout your career? Well, when I was working, when I was on active duty, uh, mentoring uh, and having mentors and mentees was never uh, mentioned or formalized. Uh, within the Army, for example, uh, we would have bosses, and of course the bosses would give guidance and advice and career uh, counseling. Uh, we had a terminology that 
people would use, such as sponsors. But usually that was sort of uh, spoken of as a third party. When two people would talk to each other, they might refer to somebody else and say that, oh, well, he has so-and-so as a sponsor. Uh, so yes, uh, when your bosses might go uh, to another assignment and because they know of your capabilities and your uh, potential, they would bring you along and be your sponsors. But again, that was not much of a open uh, formalized uh, program. Now, in my case, uh, when I looked for superiors, uh, contemporaries, and my subordinates, I really did not have any Chinese Americans or Asian Americans that were my superiors that would be role models. And so people would ask me, did that affect me in my career development? And to me, what I did was look upon those leaders, uh, whether uh, my direct superiors or further on up, uh, I looked for those that demonstrated effective leadership. And I then uh, looked to them to be my role models because uh, they were successful, they were effective. And of course, uh, uh, from that, uh, it was a opportunity for me to learn. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question would be uh, among the various issues or problem areas that you faced along the way in your career, is there anything that stands out to you and how to resolve some of those issues or problems that you were confronted with? Well, I, I, I faced a lot of challenges and issues uh, in my uh, army career as well as uh, working in the defense industry, but uh, one that comes to mind uh, has to do with uh, taking risks and where there are risks, there are also opportunities and rewards. And so this is a situation I faced uh, back in 1984. There was a large air defense program that was in trouble. It had performance issues, it had cost issues. Uh, it was written up in the headlines of the Washington Post and the New York Times. Uh, Congress was very much upset. In fact, Congress uh, developed uh, uh, special language where they required that the Army conduct a special uh, follow-on evaluation, force-on-force force evaluation of this weapon system. Uh, they also uh, introduced restrictive language that withheld the use of procurement funds uh, on this program. And so Faced with that, the Army needed to fire the Brigadier General that was in charge of the program. And of course, you know, we learned about that program because of the publicity. And those of, at that time, I was a Colonel Project Manager. And the thought even came to my mind, myself, uh, asking myself the question of, hey, what happens if I were asked to take over the program? And sure enough, a three-star general then called me and uh, he was kind of smart or maybe being a little smart in the way he asked me the question because he, did, he didn't say anything except, do you want to move? And of course, <laughs> my natural response was, well, <laughs> where to? Uh, what for? And then he went into the explanation that he needed to replace the Brigadier General. And he asked me if I would take this on. And of course, here I was, I was on a successful program. The program was in production with a new capability. Uh, we were fielding the system. I could have stayed on, retired as a Colonel. But then I said to myself, here's this program in trouble. It's also an opportunity. And so I said, yes, I would take on the program, even though this uh, did not mean a promotion 
that this was a Brigadier General's position. So when I took over the program and that announcement was made, friends of mine would come up to me and ask me, hey, I don't know whether to congratulate you or send you my condolences. And when I took over, nothing had been done on this follow-on evaluation. You know, there was no funding, there was no test plan, there was no designation of the organizational unit to conduct this test and no test range. I get a call from the same three-star general who, uh, one day and he says, uh, get on an airplane and go to this air defense center conference at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, El Paso, because the vice chief of staff, the four-star vice chief of staff of the army will be there and they're giving them him a program review. And so I go there and I tell the three star, please try and set up a private meeting between me and the four star uh, vice chief of staff of the army, because I really wanted to talk to him about the situation on the follow on evaluation. However, uh, that didn't happen because I think all the generals went to a breakfast together <laughs> and they did invite me. But anyways, the meeting goes on and on. And finally, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the four star has to go. But he remembered. So he turns around. I'm sitting in the back and he says, Billy, what have you got? Now, nobody calls me Billy except my dad and mom and this particular four star general. And here it is, what I meant to have was a private meeting to him and I need to speak up then in front of the whole audience. So I go to the front of the room and I say to myself, I need to give my elevator speech. And I think everybody knows what an elevator speech is. You know, you have 20 seconds to meet with somebody, somebody you really need to talk to and you need to deliver your message. So I went up to the front of the room and I made a short, concise message looking directly at the four-star general saying, sir, I need your help. For the follow-on uh, follow evaluation directed by Congress, we have no funding, we have no test range, and we have no uh, unit designated to conduct the test. That's all I said. So, the four star then turns to the ranking three star who was from the Pentagon and said, Lou, where are you on this? And there was $75 million required for this test. And so the three star then explains, we need $75 million in funding. We have that funding in the R&D and procurement appropriation, but we need the funds in the operations and maintenance appropriation. So we need to do the reprogramming. And so uh, we'll do that. The general then has to leave. So he, he leaves and he says, fix it. And that's it. And from, and of course that was enough <coughs> for the, the army to do the reprogramming and to get the funding. Now, this meeting is in El Paso, Texas. And to get to the East Coast, people have to go from El Paso to Dallas. I'm boarding the plane and here it is. I see, see three of the generals sitting there and they see me and they're all grinning at me. And one of them gives me a thumbs up because they know that I accomplished my mission by getting to the vice chief of staff. Now, it turns out those three were generals that I previously worked for. The four-star general I previously had worked for when he was a two-star. Anyways, what are the lessons learned from something like this? Number one, if an opportunity arises, you may have to take risks. So taking the risks are okay. And in this case, it provided an opportunity and also resulted in in some reward. Another thing though is you have to tread lightly. So whatever you do, in my case, you know, 
<clears throat> I didn't make a big emotional plea to the vice chief of staff for this funding. You have to tread lightly also because it's almost like being a whistleblower in this case, because I didn't go up the chain of command to get to the vice chief of staff and people could be upset at that. A third lesson is don't burn your bridges behind you. And so in this case, dealing with the Operational Test and Evaluation Agency, he was a two-star general, I was a colonel, and we had to work together to get through this test. But what happens? The two-star general later gets promoted to four stars. I later get promoted, and when I'm a two-star, he's my boss, my direct boss. So that's a lesson learned. But uh, let me go back to <clears throat> this uh, uh, experience that I had. Uh, in this program, I had to brief the Secretary of Defense twice. Now, normally as a project manager, program manager, you never brief the Secretary of Defense. But to brief the Secretary of Defense, what happens? You have to brief and give pre-briefs at each of the uh, intermediate levels. So we go to this last session with the Army and I'm briefing the Chief of Staff of the Army and I finish and I sit down. The generals have their continued discussion, but then the Chief turns to me, points at me and says, I wanna see you after this meeting. And so I'm sitting there wondering, hey, what did I do? Uh, what haven't I done, et cetera. So the meeting gets done, the chief of staff comes over and then he says, the day after tomorrow, the Brigadier General's list is coming out and you're on it, congratulations. So that was certainly good news. I couldn't tell anybody until the formal announcement, but that was a good way to be a part of this particular experience. Kevin? That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that story and also some of the lessons learned um, out of it. So now that uh, you retired after 32 years of active military service uh, and 18 years in the commercial uh, defense industry, how do you end up? Well, like other retirees, I do all the honeydews around the house. No, seriously, about three and a half years ago, I was a volunteer in getting recognition for Chinese American World War II veterans. There were bills introduced in Congress for the award of the Congressional Gold Medal to Chinese American World War II veterans, where the, Ch where the Congressional Gold Medal is the highest award given by Congress. And so, uh, what we did was we had to get uh, House members and senators to be co-sponsors of the bill. And so that took about a two-year effort. And finally, uh, the bills were passed in Congress and the Congressional Act was signed to award the Congressional Gold Medal to Chinese American veterans. And since then, we've been uh, uh, getting the metal designed. Uh, we've been doing the registration and verifying the registration of all the veterans. And so we're looking forward uh, to the official awards ceremony, hopefully uh, in early December. We did have an earlier date in April uh, where the Speaker of the House would have the uh, give the official uh, ceremony. However, that was canceled due to COVID. Uh, another thing that I've been working on, and you see my virtual background, is I was the chief editor on a book put together called Unsung Heroes, which is a story about the involvement and contributions of Chinese American World War II veterans. And growing up, I certainly wish that I could have read a book like this where we recap the contributions and we uh, have articles that are written by uh, notable uh, 
authors as well as sons and daughters talking about their veteran uh, fathers. And so uh, I've been promoting the book and certainly uh, it leaves a legacy and is a, a commemorative book for our current and future generations. Awesome. I'm definitely uh, very excited to read that book uh, later on. I think, right, there's a lot of, a lot of history uh, that we are not always privy to. Uh, exciting to, and worthwhile to be able to learn uh, some of that personal history. Um, I guess now we actually have a lot of questions from the audience. I'm trying to look right now to group them together. It's got a pretty far ranging uh, list of questions. So first one I think is related to your career. Uh, so similarly, two, two part question. One, what advice would you give to young Asian American military officers today? And then related to that, were there any challenges uh, of being Asian in the military? Okay, those are uh, good questions. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities for leadership in military service. And uh, just about any college major, for example, could find a specialty uh, and you could progress and uh, occupy uh, leadership positions uh, in those different fields. Now, uh, what is realistic and practical, of course, is that uh, for those that aspire to achieve high rank, uh, by high rank I mean, say, at the three-star and four-star level, uh, most of those have a operational background. That means uh, in your respective service, uh, uh, you're a commander of uh, uh, mostly combat units. Uh, you work in uh, de developing operational plans and training. Uh, at the same time, if uh, that is not your area, uh, there are opportunities. For example, my uh, specialty was in weapons acquisition. Uh, and so that really was like technical management and program management. And so there are certainly opportunities there uh, to uh, get into responsible uh, positions. Uh, my advice for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans is what I call the need to blend in while standing out. Now, because of our skin color, we automatically stand out. That means if you're in a room, you stand out already. So that means you are under observation. You will be noticed. What this means is, and this could be in a classroom environment, it could be in a work environment, when you speak up, when you uh, address the group, or uh, if you're trying to solve a problem and you're coming up with a, a solution, make use of uh, your capabilities, your intellect, uh, your techniques, so that People who uh, get your uh, product, whether it's a uh, conversation or a real world solution, so they know that it'll be a good product. And so I use the expression blending in uh, while standing out and that you should excel in the process because you are noticed. Thank you. I think that gets to uh, the next couple of questions just regarding some of um, challenges that you have faced. Uh, so standing out blending and challenges that you have faced or your father has faced um, specifically just with your race. So as you broke class ceilings about the defense industry uh, and the military, you know, did you notice any particular challenges that you had to overcome? Uh, or do you think that the blending, uh, blending in, you know, standing out was all that you really needed to do? Okay, in my case, uh, I don't think uh, I was 
discriminated against. I don't think that I received uh, uh, treatment, uh, adverse treatment because of my race. Uh, I believe that the military services uh, have a merit-based system. For example, for officers, there's a annual uh, officer efficiency report or officer evaluation report. That's an evaluation based upon performance and potential. And so, yes, you have to uh, do well and get good evaluations, but uh, it is merit-based. Uh, we have also a centralized promotion uh, system, uh, particularly for higher ranking officers, where there's a centralized board as opposed to a decentralized uh, local selection process. So records are reviewed and uh, uh, rank ordering of those records take place. Uh, so. Uh, effectively, you're looked at uh, based upon your your record, and not by you know local bosses that you know may have an influence on you. Thank you for that insight. Uh, transitioning away from your military career, uh, one of the questions is: What were your biggest challenges when you did transition from the military to corporate life, and then how did you end up tackling this? Okay, there are uh, different sets of challenges. Uh, I would say on the whole that in uh, industry and in the companies that we work for, that there is more a streamlined staff compared to uh, what we see in the military. So on one hand, uh, what that means is that you as an individual uh, probably need to do more work on your own. Uh, so that's one difference. In other words, you, you may not have a big staff to rely upon. Uh, the uh, a second difference is in the military, there is a straight uh, chain of command, so to speak. And so uh, there's a division of labor that's pretty well established. Uh, by uh, what is known as uh, the line organization and the staff organizations. On the civilian side, you still can have a line and staff organization, but what I experienced was, uh, depending upon who occupies what position, they can exert influences or influences more so in, into another functional area. Uh, so that division of labor uh, is not necessarily clear. Uh, the way you handle that, of course, uh, of, is strictly uh, interpersonal relationships and leadership. Uh, if you're at the receiving end of something that isn't right, then uh, you have to face up to it and can, uh, confront the individual concern and uh, unfortunately if that doesn't work out then uh, seek a resolution at a higher level. Great. Um, I guess going over to the book, uh, Unsung Heroes, was there anything uh, that you didn't know while you were writing the book or putting it together? Uh, anything that I didn't what include? Oh, anything that you didn't know? Oh, anything that, oh, certainly there was a lot <laughs> that I didn't know. Uh, you know, when you're trying to put together a book, you know, in our case, we had a bunch of volunteers and, um, you know, you get ideas and and whatnot. However, just in terms of coverage, there's a lot that people uh, don't cover. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at uh, the involvement of Chinese American veterans in World War II, it was across the full spectrum of war. Uh, everything from, from combat to combat support 
to logistics, administration, and so forth. And so we could have covered uh, a wide range uh, within the book. And uh, unfortunately, we just didn't have the time uh, to do so. Can you turn on your mic? Sorry. Yes. Great. Um, someone here mentioned a person called Wang Su, who was Boeing's first aeronautical engineer and MIT alum, who also worked at CNAC and COMAC. Did your father know him personally? Yes, I believe so. Now, a little bit of some of you know Wang Su because he was the first engineer hired by Boeing. And okay. those of you that uh, have been to Seattle, there's the uh, flight museum that Boeing has. And so Wang Su is recognized there. I mentioned earlier that uh, my father was involved in the Campco Loy Wing uh, plant on the China-Burma border. There's a photo that was taken in 1939 uh, at that plant and Wong Su is in the front row of that picture. My uh, William Pauley is in the uh, second row, the back row, and my father is standing next to William Pauley. Now Wong Su uh, also worked for CNAC uh, and I believe he was the chief engineer for CNAC, the uh, airline that was uh, affiliated with uh, Pan American Airlines. General, before we transition to the ending of this session, do you have any last comment? Well, <laughs> let me mention uh, the first major contribution of Chinese Americans in the United States, and that's building the Transcontinental Railroad. The second major contribution of Chinese Americans were all the uh, veterans who served in World War II because uh, they volunteered and they served at the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Now, 40% of the Chinese American veterans of World War II were non-citizens, yet they volunteered and served in spite of the discriminatory actions of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so they were proud to serve as Americans and more so post-World War II, they helped to open up opportunities for all Chinese and Asian Americans so that we and the next generation could live the American dream. And when you read my book and see some of the bios that are in the book, there's a common thread of these Chinese American veterans. And that is they came back from the war. They still continued to do hard work and sacrifice, but they encouraged their follow on generations to get an education. And then that opened up the world. So as an example, at the 150th anniversary of the Chinese, uh, of the uh, uh, railroad, uh, Transcontinental Railroad, I was a guest speaker. And I made a statement, only in America, only in America could a descendant of a Chinese American railroad worker become a major general in the United States Army. When you look at the Chinese population all over the world, we have Chinese immigrants in multiple generations all over the world. And yet we never seem to hear of immigrants in those countries that rise up to top positions in their country, whether in business government or academia. And so in this audience of all of you, I know there's first generation and second generation where you got your PhD or you became doctors, uh, doctors, uh, dentists, uh, lawyers, et cetera, and you immediately uh, establish yourselves 
as part of this legacy of progress. And so why is that? It's because of the opportunities in America. It's because of uh, freedom that, the, that we have in America and the rule of law. And it's those opportunities and that freedom that all, that all of us should be grateful for. Thank you, General Chen and Major Liu for an inspiring event. Thank you, audience, for joining us. We hope that you have enjoyed our event. You are invited to join General Chen and Major Liu at our Zoom after party this Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to share your thoughts and experiences. The registration link is in the chat. You are important to us. We want to hear from you. My LinkedIn address is shown in the chat. Please link in with me. Send me your feedback and your email address if you wish to join our emailing list for future events. For MIT alumni and students, please join the Chinese alumni of MIT. You don't have to be Chinese. Uh, you don't have to be Chinese. We are honored <laughs> to, to serve all of you. May you be safe. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.